everybody. So this video sums up what this session is all about. It's about the frenetic transformation of, and fundamental transformation of the media and entertainment business that's happening right now. It's global. It is not a US-based uh, opportunity or activity. It's truly global. And it's driven by new forces. The forces, of course, of digital, the forces of mobile, the forces of social, and of course, new millennial behavior. And so the video session is called MCNs, MPNs, and OTTs. But those ac acronyms truly trivialize how fundamental this transformation is. Make no mistake, these are new media companies. These are new media companies with new ways to tell stories across new platforms. And the largest media companies of the world, like Disney, recognize smartly that they don't have the DNA to play in this new world order that's very mobile driven and millennial focused. So that's the fundamental reason that Disney went out and acquired one of the leading MCNs known as uh, Maker Studios for nearly $1 billion. So that's the kind of activity we're seeing in the space and we'll talk about that today with our panelists. My name is Peter Chotti. I'm the CEO of Manat Digital Media. I've been in the media and entertainment business for 25 years. Half my time has been with the major studios like Universal. Half my time has been in, as an entrepreneur, like many of you, building companies, raising companies, selling companies. I'm based in Los Angeles where a lot of the activity is happening, but certainly not all of it. And we work very closely with media companies, multi-channel networks, and everything in between we also invest to bring those opportunities to light. So that's a little bit of background. We'll start with the panel because we don't have that much time. And we have a great, uh, a great group of panelists, small, but it will give them a chance to talk. So you've already met uh, Malte. So Malte joined back on the stage. And I'd like to introduce you to Urs Site, who's the managing partner of BDMI, the investment arm of media giant Bertelsmann. BDMI is one of the most prolific and successful investors in this overall, di this new world order that I'm talking about, making acquisitions or investments in Style Hall, one of the leading MCNs or the leading MCN for girls, fashion and beauty that was acquired by uh, Luxembourgian media giant RTL for well north of $100 million, and also an investor in, and I'll tell you, let you tell more, in uh, Drama Fever that was acquired by SoftBank. So just a couple of the different investments. So Urs, give some more background about yourself and then uh, your view of the world since we both had a chance to give a little bit of ours. Sure. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for having me. So uh, I'm Urs. As mentioned, I run Bertelsmann's Venture Fund. We're an early stage corporate VC, typically writing 500 to $5 million checks in early stage like A, B round companies. Um, and we are highly focused as an investor. Uh, we only invest in three themes, and one of them is online video. So a third of my time I spend in online video. The other two sectors are ad tech slash pop tech, how we call it, and next gen publishing, things like, you know, Mike Media, BuzzFeed, things like that. Um, so uh, you mentioned a couple of our online video investments, which was Style Hall and Drama Fever. We have a couple more. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about my view on the world and how do we end up investing in those. Um, so two and a half years ago, roughly, we decided that short form video was kind of important. We saw the usage grow on YouTube, and we decided to create one of our own kind of Lumascapes for the short form video ecosystem to find out whether there are any spaces that we particularly like or whether there are white spots that we think we should invest in. So we created the whole map from content production to consumption, laid out all the players, the, the horizontal MCNs, like the makers and uh, uh, full screen, the vertical MCNs, which are focused on just one topic. Style Hall for fashion was the one that we invested in. But there are others like Me Too for Latinos or uh, GT Channel for automotive uh, fans. Uh, and all the other players as well, like the agencies, the ad tech part. And, uh, what we liked about the ecosystem is that we, as a fund, like the vertically focused ones more. 
for, I mean, that I, I definitely was wrong considering how much Maker uh, got acquired for. But that's the new game. It really is vertically focused right now. So we thought, and I think maybe we were a little late to the game, but I think Maker was already uh, uh, highly valued when, when we started investing uh, in online video. Um, so we like the vertical ones for multiple reasons. We think it's easier to, to exit a company that is vertically focused. Because if you own fashion in video, you know, it's more interesting even to some, some you know, technically it could, could be interesting to uh, brands. It could be uh, magazine companies, not only a huge big media company. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons. And we think it's easier to create a, a reputation for yourself. So and also a more passionate audience because it's focused. And so when you have a more passionate audience, you'll be able to monetize arguably more effectively. Exactly. And then that brings, me, brings us to the next point already, actually. Uh, not sure whether we already want to uh, jump in. Okay. Um, so for our view on YouTube is YouTube is great to get a lot of uh, distribution and kind of uh, audience. But it's not great if that's the only source of monetization. Like we at BDMI, we don't like it if the only source is YouTube. Uh, so in Style Hall's case, they made uh, the majority of their money was, uh, uh, was branded entertainment. So it's, it's not the check that YouTube cuts you for the, your share of the ad, of the pre-roll or mid-roll. It's, uh, it's a deal that the YouTube did themselves with L'Oreal or people like that to create videos and you know, get, get paid this way, where YouTube doesn't get a cut. So it's more attractive. And that also brings us to MPN, because you don't only yeah. do that on, on YouTube. If, you, if these brands want to spend a seven-figure amount for a, uh, for a brand deal, you have to offer them a whole package on all the other social platforms as well. There have to be interactions on Twitter and Instagram and, and not only YouTube. So uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why we, we decided to, to invest in, in that one company. Yeah. So I'll sing your praises very smartly. I'm going to step back for a second because I, we always assume that people know what MCN mean. Just by a show of hands, how many of you know what MCNs are? OK, many don't, <laughs> which is understandable. So multi-channel networks are really new media companies that have, that have been originally built on top of YouTube, aggregating YouTube channels, typically under a mm -hmm. theme like fashion or beauty. So it's an organized uh, channel, essentially, think, or network. Think of it that way, with a focused audience, so that there's more critical mass and advertisers can sell more. They can sell ads more effectively against that higher CPM rates, um, some original programming, ultimately, things like that. So that's what an MCN is. But originally really built on top of YouTube, and they've expanded, and we'll talk about that. But one of the really important things that Urs highlighted was that they're really no longer MCNs. That's a moniker that's not used that much anymore because we have all these new platforms. So in the last year, Facebook, Snapchat, all of these other platforms have become fundamentally important to these video creators. So that's why it's multi-platform networks rather than MCNs. So in any event, I'm going to get into some questions now, and, and I'll ask you first, Malta. In the last year and a half, we've had this continuing strings of significant exits from major MPNs. So originally, really the first one I believe that was of note was DreamWorks acquired Awesomeness TV for about $115 million ultimately. Then Disney, we talked about it, acquired uh, Maker for nearly a billion, ends up closer to $750 million. You know, wh why quibble over a quarter of, of a billion dollars? Outer Media then, which is a joint venture between Chernin Group and AT&T, acquired full screen for 200 to 300 million dollars, and you're seeing a pattern here. And then RTL paid about 150 million, we think. Pro Sieben and Stu Studio 71, they merged with Collective Digital Studio for a deal valued at 240 million dollars, roughly, including some cash. So my question, my question to you is, there are many skeptics who look at those numbers and they wonder how can those, lo and they call them lofty numbers, be justified and rationalized? I think the an answer is in the graph I showed. Um, these, uh, at least half of the parties you mentioned, <coughs> ProSieben, uh, for example, they are on the dotted line. Their en entire audience in their base business is plus 40 and it's getting older one year every year. So 
maybe uh, looking at looking at sort of the bottom line of these businesses, they're they're not worth the numbers. But this is not about acquiring uh, EBITs. This is ab about taking control of an audience to make sure you're still in business in 30 years. Yeah. Now that's an excellent point. Um, one of the things that when, when I speak with a number of the major U.S. media companies, I hear all the time by a number of them, well, there's no proven business model. You know, there's not that. So we can't get into that space yet because we don't know. And my, my feeling is exactly that. Yeah. This is where the audience is. And, and uh, Disney paying that uh, very big amount for Maker Studios, I think is the clearest example and is also uh, <coughs> so natural that that was the first one. Because Disney, being who they are, if they're not where the kids are, they're gone. Yeah. And the kids, obviously, are not in cable television anymore. Absolutely. And Urs, so when you get an investment opportunity like a style hall or something, how do you look at the business model and just what, what interests you as an investor? Well, I mean, for one, it's definitely unit economics or is it, is it a business that could be profitable if you wanted to, which sometimes as a VC, you see business models that are you know, gross margin negative and even at high growth and in 10 years, they're not going to show a lot of profit. So it, we are a little bit more conservative than some other VCs. I'm, I'm not necessarily banking on getting, I mean, I want to sell all of our companies as soon as possible with a high enough return. Uh, but it, we don't bank on something where uh, even in five, six years down the road, there is no understanding that this is a real business. So Salho, for example, I think within three years, four years, they had a very nice double digit million revenue uh, number. Of course, if you grow that fast, they were not profitable. I mean, that's, that's how you get to that, those huge uh, growth numbers. But when we look at a business, we want to understand the different lines of business that are in there. We want to understand the margin. And yes, as a VC, we accept that you lose money the first couple of years because that's how you grow that fast. But we want to understand that there is a positive business to be had in, the, in a going concern stage. Interesting. That, that's how we look at it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll find VCs who are a little less focused on that. But you know, so I have a German so parent company, so we're... So we're you're, you're, you're disciplined. <laughs> so you believe that these new media companies, digital first media company, can be standalone, profitable, long-term viable oh, yes. businesses? Oh, yes. What are the revenue streams that are interesting to you? Because men, most or I would say most people who are fairly close to the business are skeptical of advertising. So what else is there? I mean, I, I mean we as a fund, we are big fans of native or branded content. So definitely branded. it's one yeah. that we like a lot. Multiple reasons for it. I mean, there, let's start with the negatives of it. Very often if, if people talk about these branded campaigns, the scaling is the one issue with it. it it's, it's a lot of hand-holding. The brand talks to you about what they want to create. You have to then either create the content or talk to your creators to produce it. Uh, then it has to typically has to be approved. And like, it's, it's a big process. And if you have to do all this for you know, a $20,000, $30,000 campaign, it's not really worth it. But I mean, in, in Stalhol's case, we saw that the number of clients who had seven-figure deals with them was like, it was a, a, a big number of them, actually. We don't, I don't think we have many other startups that, that, that reached uh, uh, that customer roster that quickly. Yeah. So, and if, if you have a seven-figure deal, it's worth your time. It's worth hand-holding. You can actually hire someone to make sure that that one project goes, goes through the way it should. So, so we still like branded content. And there are some other, so that was the negative, the scaling issue. The positive about branded content is uh, ad blockers don't block it. I mean, it's, it, it, speaks, it speaks the language of the generation. If you just go on YouTube and look for, uh, I don't know, just take any uh, cosmetic brands and look for their videos that they have on there, and just check out how many views they have and how many engagements are with that video, how many comments, how many shares, things like that. And then compare that to what a typical YouTuber has that talks about fashion, about maybe the same products. And you'll see a huge difference because the, the normal videos that brands produce don't really speak the language <coughs> of, the, of the audience that they're targeting or trying to target on YouTube. So I think... Uh, uh, these branded content work better with young people, with the millennials. They don't get skipped. So there are multiple benefits to it. So that it's one of the 
the revenue streams we like a lot, but it's not the only one. I mean, Drama Fever was a company that was uh, something like a Hulu for Asian content in the US. So it was Korean primetime drama uh, over the top. You can watch it on your browser uh, uh, in the US. And they had a very large subscription number. So there, we, we do like subscription revenue. If you get your customers to pay for something, it's, I think it's one of the best ways of making money. Yeah. But I don't, I don't necessarily agree that advertising is uh, difficult or that. Online video advertising is doing quite well. Yeah, it, it, it depends how you define it. That's yeah. exactly right. You know, to your point of branded uh, content, one of the, you, you hear a lot about authenticity in this world. That's the fundamental theme that you hear when it comes to a new YouTube celebrity, which are really the new kinds of celebrities. Those that are, have grown up from the grassroots authentic. Same thing with brands. The branded content that works, they don't try to hide the fact that they are, they're part of the overall video engagement, but it's to come up with something that's compelling story, storytelling that's authentic so that then people, they understand it, but that's okay. They're not hoodwinked by it, but they then spread it around. So Malte, how about you for your company and your business model? What are the various revenue streams that you have now and where you see it going into the future? Well, we do both. We do both advertising and branded content. And I'd say looking at advertising, I realize why some of the multinational super big MCNs are skeptical about the future of advertising. I'm not. I'm not at all because the, um, the vertical of my MCN is the Nordics, which is a very small part of the world. I mean, just being big in Finland is a small enough vertical to really be relevant also in traditional advertising. Uh, so when looking at our turnover, it's about 40% advertising, 40% uh, branded entertainment. So we have a, a good balance and we're actually going the other way now with the advertising and going into local advertising, selling advertising over Helsinki instead of Finland, for example. It brings the prices up, that's the point. Um, and then we have some 20% consultancies and things like that. But both, both our advertising and our branded entertainment are really showing very healthy growth numbers. So for this little market, we believe in both. But if I was full screen, I would probably say something else. But I'm not. Well, I, as I said, I work with a number of different multi-channel networks, and they are MPNs. Uh, and, and each has a different personality. So that means that their revenue model may be different. But one of the things that we see consistently now, which we didn't before, is that in order to expand the revenue streams beyond advertising and beyond, beyond branded content, there's real significant money in original programming. So you're seeing original programming with uh, the major over-the-top providers like Amazon, uh, Netflix, Hulu, and international players. It's very much an HBO kind of strategy where original exclusive content. Well, you see the same thing that's happening now in, in the in the new media space of multi-platform networks, where I'll pick one that I know well, Whistle Sports, sports-focused MPN. And they've created an they're creating an original slate of programming for a, very, uh, for a new, significant, over-the-top provider in the United States from the major carrier, Verizon. And that service is called Go90. They were in the video. And, and Whistle Sports is getting paid millions of dollars in order to provide that content. So there's a significant new revenue stream in that regard, and you see that consistently. But Style Hall is an example where you have fashion and beauty. It seems to lend itself to commerce. Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening in any time in the not too distant future? Sure, I mean, it was always part of our, our uh, investment thesis that fashion and beauty are great categories for commerce. Uh, you already see there is a partnership with Amazon and Style Hall where you see some of the videos that the YouTubers created about, I don't know, doing smoky eyes or like <laughs> some tutorials. And you see those videos on the Amazon pages where you can buy the product for, uh, for that beauty product. So uh, definitely uh, part of the thesis. And uh, just to add to your, to, or to strengthen the point you made earlier, 
There are now so many platforms out there that as a content producer, it's, it's actually good for you. You, oh, have, you have Vessel, you have uh, Go90 from Verizon, you have Watchable from Comcast, and then you have still Yahoo and Facebook and all the other ones, and they all want content. All of those that were in the video, that's, yeah. that was the point of the video, to show yeah. you that it's massive. It is. So yeah, I mean, so commerce definitely is, uh, I don't think that someone yet has completely nailed yeah. the uh, home shopping version of online video. Uh, it's a thesis we had and we looked for someone. If there's someone in the room, please grab me afterwards. Uh, but it's, uh, it's definitely, we think, video does help with conversion for, for, for converting someone to buy something. Uh, YouTube is used by a lot of uh, users to just look for products that they want to buy. They want to see how does it, what, what are the dimensions if someone holds it and, and, and things like that. So we are big believers, but I don't think it is completely solved yet. Right. Um, one, I know that speaking to other investors, including many European investors, one MC or MPN that keeps coming up on the commerce front is a company called Tastemade. Tastemade is food and travel, and it seems to lend itself to the potential for commerce in a very significant way. So there's another data point of, uh, of a company to watch that's hot on the radar screen of many different potential acquirers. And in that regard, apart from your company, of course, which is on the list, I'm sure, but who else are some significant players in this new media game that might be interesting. Just a couple names and a couple vertical markets. We'll do a lightning round. Sure, well, I'll just, I'll just uh, uh, pimp out my portfolio. Okay, so, uh, 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 well. so we, we are a large investor in a company called Jukin Media. They're the market leader for uh, all the viral video clips you see. Like if there's a small dog saving the baby from whatever, yeah. that video very likely was acquired by, by that company and licensed to all the TV channels and, and so that's one player. I'll make, a, I'll make a prediction there. Jukin Media will be acquired in the next six months. I can't comment on that. It will, that will happen. Very okay. possible. Uh, other ones, uh, I mean, Me Too I mentioned for the Latinos. Um, whistle for... Whistle for sports. Dance uh, on for dance and music. Exactly. I mean, you find for all these categories, you find someone M great. Malte, how about in Europe and the rest of the world? Because we don't want to be US-centric here. And that was, again, the point of the video is that this is happening everywhere. But what are some other uh, uh, leading European MPNs? Leading European? Um, I, I, I myself am um, more focused, as I mentioned, on geographically uh, focused MCNs rather than vertical. Yeah. Um, I could say that in some of the cases of the genre verticals, I don't even believe in them because you can't be all over the world in such a small ver vertical. Um, the geographical, geographically focused MCNs have a better platform, I think, because that's how the ad market thinks. Very few advertisers are multi-language, yeah. multi-territory. I would say there, there's one here in Finland called Tötere that I'm, I think is doing a really good job in a small market. Um, there are a couple of uh, other ones in, um, in other countries. There's Maze in Denmark that I have a sort of a crush on. Um, yeah. Okay. So we talked about MCNs built on top of YouTube and then now there's competing platforms. Well, I, 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 well, I'll, alternative I'll, platforms. No, no I'll, uh, I'll be completely honest here. Before I came here today, yeah. I had never heard the abbreviation MPM, uh, but I really like it because I, I think Thank it's a it's, um, natural change, so to say. I think the, the MCNs that haven't become MPNs are, uh, if, they, if they exist, they, they, they haven't understood something fundamental. Because as I've shown with the, the ad case I showed you, uh, handling all the platforms of the creators that you represent, you must do it. Otherwise, you're not relevant. Yeah. Well, and, and so let's, let's talk about YouTube, the granddaddy that birthed this entire ecosystem, really. Um, and it's, it's frequently, I think, easily a target in the press and in the industry for its, its, its revenue splits and things like that, but it created the market. 
But given the fact that now there are alternative platforms, and just Facebook is probably the one that's most talked about, Snapchat increasingly, but a whole host of others, is YouTube threatened? Should you t how should YouTube feel at this point? Well, uh, I'll I mean, I I'll take that, even though it's difficult and I don't think I'm, I'm not representing YouTube or something. I, I think, That's why of I course, want every opinion. other big platform is, uh, I'm not sure I would say threat, but it's definitely something they're monitoring. But to, to go back to your earlier point, YouTube got criticized a lot for the revenue split that they have. They're at least the first social platform I know that actually did write checks. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, use, you, if you were on Twitter, you were on Facebook, and you produced content, and people yeah. read that content, they read all your posts, you didn't get, get anything. Instagram doesn't write any checks yet. So I think criticism, whether the 45 split is, is, is reasonable, I think their argument is, hey, we bring the advertising, so it's a normal ad network charges also 30 35%. And they say, and we do all the hosting and stuff on top. So I mean, I can see some of the argument. And I mean, the other ones, the big ones haven't yet announced publicly what their splits are. Right. Rumors are they surprisingly are very similar to what YouTube is charging. So I, I don't think YouTube is necessarily threatened in terms of the, that the deals will be completely different. Um, but of course, I mean, if I'm a big platform and I see other platforms uh, growing quickly, I mean, if I look at our portfolio, uh, their, the number of video views they have on Facebook is growing tremendously fast, like at a, at a speed, I mean, much faster than YouTube was growing for yeah. them. Maybe because, you know, back then online video was new and now they know what they're doing, but still, it's growing quite fast. So I'm sure that all these platforms are looking at each other and, uh, and are not necessarily friends. Yeah, I'm hearing that all the time, that you see the kind of growth on Facebook is just exploding uh, for a number of the MCNs that I, or MPNs that I know, too. Well, but the, the problem is, what is a view? It's yeah, not yet exactly, exactly the same. Like, if you, if you talk to an advertiser, uh, I can't even tell you exactly what the current definition of Facebook is, what a view is. It might be four seconds in view, auto-playing without sound. That's a view. And I'm sure if you talk to a, a big brand like a L'Oreal or someone like that, I'm sure they would disagree that that's something they would want to pay for. They would want to pay for, I don't know, 80% completion of the whole thing with sound, full screen, or at least the majority of the screen. So I think the definitions are not out there yet for people to know what it is. So yes, the numbers are growing like crazy. Is it the same quality of a view? I don't know yet. I mean, I yeah. honestly don't know. Well, and that's another fundamental point here is that this is still a very new media landscape, that, so it's transforming itself all the time. So the rules of the game are not established. Uh, there's the revenue split, and I agree with you. Any platform is going to need to make money, so no matter what a split is, nobody's going to be happy with it all the time. So the rules are being, they will evolve over time with competition, and one example of that is that YouTube just recently announced YouTube Red and launched YouTube Red, which is a subscription-based service at $9.99, right? Mm -hmm. In the United States, it's $9.99 a month, which gives you an ad-free opportunity now, and it also gives original pro or exclusive programming behind the paywall. So there's a reaction that YouTube is having to better meet the needs of its audience, but certainly a reaction to what's going on into, in the overall ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So Malta, I want to talk about creators a little bit. So individual video creators, why do they come to you? What can you give them, and how do they make money? Oh, that's, that's a fairly long list, but taking from the top of the list, uh, it's uh, better ad sales, um, help with copyrights, advice, education, but honestly, uh, the ad sales are a big part of it. Um, I could drone on for an hour about this, but I covered the, the biggest ones. So, when it, But if a creator is looking at you, your company, versus a competitor, how do you differentiate yourself? What's your pitch to them? That very much depends on who is this creator. Um, our, our ad sales are better than the other ones. <laughs> that, that, that's just a fact. Yeah. You will earn more money with us than you do with Google. That is a very good argument to many people. Uh, we are really best in the market when it comes to anything about copyright, which is a big thing to some YouTubers and not a big thing to others. 
Um, but it, it really depends on the individual YouTuber and what they're doing. What do they need? Uh, maybe they need help with production. We can give that. So, Urs, when, when you speak with your companies, uh, what are some commonalities you see in terms of what's a successful, what are, what are the key um, benefits that the successful new media companies give to the creators? What can they do for them? Well, I think it's generally, uh, some were already mentioned, you make more money. I, I will bring you deals, as in, I don't know, branded content. I'll, I'll include you in some of the deals there that you, on your own, you wouldn't get. A big brand doesn't want to talk to 20, 30, you know, 18-year-old people that create YouTube videos to create a deal for a branded content production. They don't want that. They want someone else to handle all that, make sure that they use the right product, because sometimes the young people, they, for example, they, uh, I remember some cases at Starhole where people might have said, yeah, I didn't get the shampoo from that brand. Is it OK if I use the competitor's brand? And kind of, <laughs> well, if they pay for it, not, not really. So, so it, they make more revenue by, by deals like that. And another big thing very often is that the YouTube creators want to get, uh, they want to grow. They want to have collaborations with other YouTube stars. Yeah. And then yeah. they kind of cross promote each other. And then if, you know, if a big YouTuber, does a couple of videos with a new YouTube star, and they you know, work together, they link to each other's videos, you know, that grows the audience. So a lot of these people, I mean, I think I, I'd even say care more about their own profile and the growth of their, of their audience. And revenue then is a close second right after that. Yeah. So I think those are the two things. And definitely, there are some who help more with production. I think Tastemade would be one example, because they actually have a studio. Uh, but not every MCN has a, is doing a lot of there. I mean, I think a lot of them claim that they help a lot with uh, getting you to create better videos. I think it's, you know, not, not everyone actually follows through perfectly with that. Yeah. Now, for, for talent, you see, we talked a little, a little bit about the fact that um, these, U, these YouTube, and I'll use that as the ecosystem, these are the new celebrities for the teens, for the young people. And there was recently, not a couple, several weeks ago now, in Variety, which is the large media and entertainment publication that's primarily focused in the US, but it's also in Europe. They t there were surveys done and a report that for teens, by far, the YouTube celebrities are much more relevant to them and much more meaningful to them. And that is why you see that you have PewDie, let's use PewDiePie. I think the number that was reported last year, he made $14 million something like that. So there's real green that's coming here. And it's not necessarily just from the platform itself. It's frequently, because nobody knows how long the shelf life is for any one YouTube celebrity. You know, how long will they be relevant to the audience in that particular medium? But what's happening is that the brand is created, the personality is created, and then it could be monetized in many different ways. And now you increasingly see these homegrown, authentic new celebrities who are getting into television, who are getting into movies, who are doing other things and making some real significant money out of it. For example, our book publishing division, uh, Penguin Random House, publishes a couple books for big YouTubers. So, and I'm sure without being a YouTube star, they would not have necessarily gotten a book deal. So, yeah, yeah. But just also one other point for those people who don't, who kind of think we're all talking rubbish here or something. <laughs> uh, if, uh, there's a, a conference in, in, in the US called VidCon. It's oh. where all the YouTube stars and the, the fans meet. And if you've never been, and if you want to understand this ecosystem, I would highly recommend it. Uh, I think the first year, like first time I went was three years ago. And uh, you had a couple real big television celebrities, you know, the people that travel with bodyguards and, and, and their entourage. And no one cared. No one gave, uh, you know what I wanted to say. Uh, say it. No, uh, an ass. Say it. Uh, so there was a real big Hollywood star. He was walking, and no one asked for an autograph, nothing. And then a couple YouTube stars, the Fine Brothers, for those who, who know the space, came out. And you saw 200 young girls screaming, yelling, and rushing, almost killing people on the way there. And so I told, uh, for example, our board that, that I think that it is something you have to experience if you're old media. You, you don't get it. Like for the young people, you yeah. know, they, they don't really care that much about the old celebrity. And if you, once you experience it, once you see what kind of shift that is. Absolutely. I had the exact same experience when I went to VidCon. It's like Beatlemania over and over again. 
and it was insane. And even though I felt I somewhat understood the space, until you feel that, that's what's going on, and that's what the media companies need to see, and they need to move on that. Closer to home, there's TubeCon. And TubeCon, from what I understand, is, you know, it's a very sizable, significant event. And you see the same thing happening there. And so these are important events for anybody who's interested remotely in media and entertainment to actually go, go to these events, see what's happening, listen to the people, watch what the kids are doing, because whatever the kids are doing, that's where any media business needs to be. That's where the marketers need to be, and not, not too many of them still understand that, but that's changing very rapidly. So we have, the, cl the clock is ticking. We have 10 seconds left, so well, Malte? I'll say if you, if you can't go to TubeCon, I can uh, give you the address of uh, one of our, our YouTubers. Uh, people are actually sleeping in sleeping bags outside her apartment to get a chance to meet her. So. Good. You can meet Malte in front of the stage afterwards, and he'll give you that address. Same with me. If you are in the media space or a startup, need funding, let me know. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to talk to you as well. So we'll be over there. Thanks. Thanks.